So David Chayesh is going to give his research talk today after all the lecture notes that he's been, been giving uh, introduction to lattice supersymmetry. So go ahead and, and start. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for tolerating more from me on lattice supersymmetry. Some of you have already been exposed to about four hours of lectures on the general topic. And as you saw there, there was a section that I split off to focus on for this research talk because there's a lot of work in progress here rather than just the uh, background and uh, other details that I was going through last week. So this is work in three-dimensional super yang mills theory. And now going back to uh, classical computer simulations, this three means two plus one, as opposed to Shilish's uh, different counting of dimensions. Work in progress, and that, that has come out recently with some folks in the room and some folks back in England. And because some of you were here last week and heard all of the details about the constructions of these lattice theories, while some of you are new faces who just made it here over the weekend, I will start with a brief review, trying not to duplicate the four hours of last week, but still make this comprehensible to those of you who weren't there. Um, and maybe emphasizing as I go through that these three-dimensional systems, given the current state of our algorithmic technology and hardware technology, strike a nice balance between really interesting physics that we can look at, maybe more so than in one or two dimensions, while still having much more practical computational costs, at least compared to the case of four dimensions that I focused on last week. So the recent work that has come out on this is looking at um, holographic relations between maximally supersymmetric yang mills in three dimensions with 16 supercharges, that's what this Q is, compared to dual D2 brains. And the ongoing work in progress is generalizing this to look at phase transitions in the broader phase diagram in that theory, similar to the 2D case I went through briefly last week, as well as going down to the eight supercharge case um, as some preparation for the quiver super QCD construction that also popped up. So even though it's a shorter talk, do feel free to ask questions if they come up. I'll be here for the rest of the week in case I don't get through everything around to chat about any and all aspects of it. So we saw this motivation slide last week that um, lattice field theory is a way to get first principles predictions for strongly coupled field theories with a lot of potential applications to supersymmetric systems in three dimensions. We're not so concerned about the LHC and extensions of the standard model, but there's still lots of rich field theory dynamics that we can look at in here, as well as holographic connections to stringy quantum gravity in a higher number of space-time dimensions. And at the same time, we have all of that interesting physics we also have much more modest computational costs compared to that full four-dimensional n equal four theory I went through in detail last week, where I checked that in a lot of the calculations I'm going to be showing, the dimensions of the path integrals we're evaluating are more like 10 million uh, degrees of freedom as opposed to the billion that are sort of the state of the art for four-dimensional QCD and other field theories. Uh, so 10 million dimensions still require some significant computational resources, which are mostly coming through uh, national programs, USQCD in the US, program called Dirac in England, as well as local resources uh, at the University of Liverpool, which are what make this work, the numerical work I'll be showing possible. Now, in a, a single slide or two, the uh, challenge of supersymmetric lattice quantum field theories is that supersymmetry is broken. We went through this in a lot of detail last week with looking at supersymmetry as an extension of the Poincaré symmetries of space-time, which add these spinner generators, Q and Q bar, that include in the super Poincaré algebra, the anti-commutator of a Q and Q bar generates an infinitesimal translation that does not exist once the space-time is discretized and there are no longer infinitesimal uh, translations and only discrete shifts. So this breaks supersymmetry at the classical level of the algebra. It allows all possible SUSY violating operators to be generated in the course of a quantum field theory calculation. And for typical extended uh, supersymmetric quantum field theories like those I'll be talking about, we have roughly order 10 of those scalar masses, quartic uh, or for, for scalar terms, Yukawa couplings, masses for the fermions, all of which gives us a essentially uh, impractical to the point of impossible task of trying to navigate such a high dimensional parameter space to fine tune all of those uh, parameters to get back to 
the continuum supersymmetric quantum field theory of interest. And we saw last week how preserving a closed subalgebra of, the, of these supersymmetries in discrete space time can vastly improve that situation in four dimensional n equal four, getting us down to a single fine tuning to recover the correct continuum limit, even better in lower dimensions, as we'll see. And this, we looked in detail at the construction from so called topological twisting, which is equivalent or produces an equivalent construction to an approach based on orbifolded dimensional deconstruction. And there's a nice review from a decade ago with maybe the relevant takeaway message for today being that working in D dimensions requires for these procedures to go through theories with at least two to the power D supersymmetries. So going from four dimensions down to three, we have two options for the twisted approach that I'm using or thinking about. So these eight supercharged and 16 supercharged theories. I'll start off first by talking about this uh, maximally supersymmetric case, which may be easiest to understand, especially after going through the 4D case last week as the dimensional reduction of that 4D n equal four super Yang mills. So all the fields in all these cases are massless and in the adjoint rep of our gauge group, SUN. Our gauge field going down to three dimensions has three components. Seven of them have turned into scalars and with the different counting of spinner degrees of freedom, this is referred to as n equal eight uh, supersymmetry. So we have eight two component fermions corresponding to the 16 supersymmetries that we started off with and a larger uh, global R symmetry that's going to provide plenty of um, symmetry for that topological twisting procedure, which goes forward somewhat like this, um, starting with the, the full twisted construction where we already, uh, already collected the supersymmetries in the fields into one plus five plus 10 component objects for the fermions in the four dimensions, as well as these five component complexified gauge links. Reducing a dimension of those gives us two twisted scalar supersymmetries, Q and Q naught, uh, two sets of four component vectors, Q mu and Q naught mu, and then a six component anti-symmetric tensor left over, similarly for all of the fermions and the dimensional reduction of the gauge links pops out two more scalars from those gauge degrees of freedom. So mu and nu on the right-hand side in three dimensions are running from one to four here. So these are based on representations of the three-dimensional twisted rotation group. So we take the SO3 of Lorentz invariance wick rotated to Euclidean space-time, multiply that with an SO3 subgroup of the R symmetries, and look at the diagonal subgroup of that, which now gives us two uh, closed supersymmetry algebras that are preserved in finite space time. The usual Q squared being a nilpotent operator anti-commuting anti with itself. And then this new Q mu that we got from the dimensional reduction. Now, this theory is formulated now we have these four links in three space-time dimensions rather than four. So rather than five links in four space-time dimensions, we talked a lot about the A4 star lattice last week. The three-dimensional analog is A3 star known to its friends as a body-centered cubic lattice. So every point on here, we can actually fit it onto a two-dimensional slide. We can see that there are four links coming out of each point uh, in forward and backward each direction. So eight nearest neighbors for each site in a nice symmetric way spanning these three space-time dimensions. Of course, we have more basis vectors than dimensions, so that all those vectors are linearly dependent, not orthogonal. But there is a nice large four-point group symmetry that allows us to take the continuum limit in this case without any uh, need for numerical fine-tuning. So this is, like the n equal four case in four dimensions, a very uh, elegant lattice formulation and one that is insufficient for numerical calculations due to those issues of zero modes and flat directions, uh, as well as a new wrinkle of stabilizing the dimensional reduction. So starting off with a reminder of those zero modes and flat dimensions, sorry, flat directions, um, I'll remind you that working with the complexified 
gauge links promotes the SUN symmetry that we started with to a full UN symmetry. We can break that up into SUN cross U1. We have to regulate the flat directions as zero modes in both of those sectors. For the SUN sector, we use a simple, uh, simple minded supersymmetry breaking scalar potential here looking at the single trace version that is meant to constrain individually the eigenvalues of mu u bar, mu u bar the link multiplied by its conjugate. Um, whereas for the U1 sector, we implement what I introduced as the improved action last week, the constraint on the U1 sector that depends on the determinant of the plaquette is constrained supersymmetrically by modifying the moduli equations of motion. And this can be monitored. So the supersymmetry breaking that we get from this approach can be monitored by looking at these violations of ward identities for that twisted scalar supersymmetry. Some of you saw these plots last week showing that these ward identity violations are proportional to the coefficients of that supersymmetry breaking potential. So it's a soft breaking that is guaranteed to uh, kill off all of the supersymmetry violating operators that might arise when we take the limit of that parameter going to zero as part of our continuum limit. And implementing the U1 constraint supersymmetrically gives us the blue line heading toward the continuum limit, like the power of A over L squared. So an effectively order A improved action compared to the uh, unimproved case where everything was breaking supersymmetry and this approach to the continuum limit was not even linear. The new wrinkle in lower numbers of dimensions is that in the work so far, we're just taking that four dimensional code that we went through last week and setting one of the directions to have a single lattice spacing, a link that loops back around to its starting point. And it was very nice that, that Mitat went through Iguchi Kawai uh, volume independence in a lot of detail last week because we don't want that. And what we see is a nice illustration of what he was discussing the way that adjoint fermions that we have in this theory can restore the center symmetries or protect the center symmetries to give us that Iguchi Kawai, con re uh, Iguchi -Kawai construction. And that's illustrated by this time series plot on the left, which is a, a time series plot in an HMC. Um, calculation, Monte Carlo Markov chain importance sampling, where we're looking at the Wilson lines in all of the spatial directions. So the analog of the Polyakov loop. And this blue one that's standing out here is that dimensionally reduced direction that we want to interpret as just a scalar qualitatively different from the links that remain in this uh, eight cubed lattice. And it, we see that the center symmetries in essentially, especially the reduced direction, but in fact, all of them can be restored, giving us effective volume independence, four dimensional physics with a large number of colors, what we don't want. We want Kaluza Klein reduction. So we want to explicitly break that center symmetry to ensure that the reduced dimension is actually reduced. And we get to a, a different theory and a smaller number of space-time uh, dimensions. So that is incorporated into the code that's publicly available for anyone who wants to play around with this. Um, it, the construction is in fact even more complicated now than what's shown here without that additional contribution to the potential to stabilize that dimensional reduction. I forgot to mention that we are adding this with in fact the same parameter. So there's nothing additional to, to tune here. It's also part of that now at an extension of the supersymmetry breaking scalar potential. And yeah, both that dimensional reduction and the separate code for the eight supercharged theory are some of these new applications that have been developed in the time since that user guide came out and will soon be updated. So that gets me to actual physics and results with a, uh, only about halfway through the time. So that is, is in good shape so far. So the first target that we were looking at with these, this dimensionally reduced 
setup is looking at the thermodynamics of this 16 supercharge super Yang Mills theory in three dimensions, some work that came out not quite two years ago. So upon reducing these dimensions, we get a three torus that thanks to that um, body cubic centered lattice that we're working with is skewed. We talked about that briefly in the two dimensional case last week, so I won't go into any more details now. We have sort of three dimensionless extents that define this three torus and imposing thermal boundary conditions gives us a dimensionless temperature just as the inverse of the temporal extent of that torus, which is then the dimension full temperature with the dimensions canceled out by the dimension full Tuft coupling in this, these lower numbers of dimensions. And our holographic dictionary is claiming that if we look at a sufficiently low temperature at a sufficiently large numbers of colors in an SUN gauge theory, we can relate these three-dimensional super Yang mill system to the behavior of uh, black brains in the dual supergravity. So going to low temperatures reduces the role of alpha prime corrections, going to large N reduces the role of string corrections. So we can compare numerical results from lattice field theory with just leading order uh, supergravity predictions for the setup with some, some black brains in that dual supergravity. Now going from two dimensions to three dimensions, we get a much richer phase diagram predicted by these holographic considerations, especially because we, are, we have the option of allowing different extents for the two spatial directions that we now have. So if we set both of those to be equal, so R1 equals R2, and we can vary that RL independently of the inverse temperature R beta, we have a situation analogous to the two-dimensional case. So I just took the two-dimensional cartoon for the expected phase diagram and put in some uh, new commentary uh, in the high temperature limit. So that's small R beta, the fermions are going to pick up a large thermal mass, decouple. The scalars are no longer protected. We can expect them to decouple as well. We can end up with a uh, two-dimensional system of pure gluonic dynamics, where we expect what I called a spatial deconfinement transition, which caused some confusion last week, a breaking of the center symmetry in the spatial direction, while the center symmetry in the temporal direction is always broken to keep the system thermally deconfined and in correspondence with the, uh, the holographic space-time that has some black holes or black brains in it. In those low temperatures where that leading order supergravity can become reliable on the uh, holographic perspective, we also expect a deconfinement transition going from a D2 gravity, so a space-time with a homogeneous D2 brain wrapping around on that horizon that then collapses in this transition to the a system of a localized D0 black hole. The plot on the right is the more complicated case where the two spatial directions have different extents. In fact, this one uh, some, from some work by my collaborator, Toby Wiseman and his collaborators is considering the case where one of those directions is actually infinite and the other is given by this uh, dimensionful L, where that D2 brain can be identified in roughly the same place. And there are a couple of phase transitions that are predicted, the red and blue lines, where the dotted lines are various uh, stringy duality relations, an S-duality, T-duality, and M-theory uplifts, giving all sorts of different phases, and in particular, a transition from D2 to a D1 theory, where um, the extended object goes from wrapping a two-dimensional uh, two brain to that uh, that line that we that was the uh, relevant case in the one the sorry the two D theory we talked about briefly last week. No, so yeah, I'm going a bit too slowly. I'll speed up a bit. The first uh, target that we're going or the first 
regime in this phase diagram that we're going to look at to test these gauge gravity expectations is looking at this simple D2 brain, the homogeneous black brain with all three directions of the torus set to be equal and taken to be relatively large, relatively low temperature to ensure that we are in this regime, this phase. We can check that we are in the correct phase first by looking at the phases of the eigenvalues of the Wilson lines that are the order parameter for this spatial deconfinement transition. In the, so in that D2 phase, the phases of these eigenvalues are expected to be uniformly distributed around the complex plane around the angle minus pi to pi, at least in the large end limit. So what we're looking at here is a dimensionless temperature of around 0.3, relatively low, though not the lowest we looked at, and looking at three different values of the number of colors. So U4, U6, and U8 age groups. And what we can see is a slow approach to uniformity as n, the number of colors increases. So the red histogram for four colors is more sharply peaked around zero. And as the number of colors increases, the peak decreases and that is shifted into the, the bits that are further away from the center, gradually approaching that uniformity in the large end limit, telling us that we are looking at the phase we want. So in that phase, we can measure a simple observable. The bosonic action of the system is dual to the internal energy of that black brain. And in the D2 phase, the leading order prediction is that this internal energy should be proportional to T to the power three and a third, which is this black dotted line that we approach as the temperature becomes sufficiently small. Um, and at higher temperatures, we go up to the higher temperature T cubed behavior, that red line, we're gradually uh, interpolating from that high temperature limit to the lower temperature expectation. One nice aspect of this work was that we carried out our first continuum extrapolations. The plot looks a bit pixelated to me. I'm not sure how that happened, but uh, we have multiple lattice volumes that allow us to take the continuum extrapolation, L going to infinity with a fixed dimensionless temperature. Um, in four of the six cases that we're looking at here, it's actually a flat extrapolation consistent with a zero slope, but there are two where um, the extrapolation matters and in fact gets us closer to that leading order expectation. As a brief aside, I'll mention the, that the fact that the continuum limit is taken with this fixed dimensionless temperature that depends on the inverse lattice tuft coupling is actually very nice for showing us that we don't have a sign problem in this system as the lattice volume gets larger toward the continuum limit and we want this product of L times lambda to be constant, we have to uh, decrease the bare tuft coupling in the lattice theory at the UV cutoff in lockstep so that um, this has the effect that the Fafian phase is always for us very nearly real and positive. We can do phase reweighting with no issues and there's no sign problem setting in. So even on small volumes for the relevant range of couplings, the Fafian phase is within a couple percent of unity. So moving on quickly in the last, oh, sorry. Yeah, moving on quickly in the last few minutes to work in progress, we want to start moving beyond that single D2 phase and looking at these expected transitions. So our approach for this is the same as I showed in two dimensions, fix an aspect ratio going along a straight line, a diagonal line in this phase diagram, scan in the inverse temperature and look at the Wilson line as a order parameter of this so-called spatial deconfinement transition. These are some very preliminary results uh, looking into that, uh, again, showing the symmetric volumes, A cubed, 12 cubed, and 16 cubed, extending from the range of the D2 phase across that transition into the D0 phase, where we are seeing a peak forming with results that are currently running as I speak, as well as a jump in this order parameter. The characteristics of this jump make me think that there is some hysteresis going on that will have to be 
checked out, but we are getting uh, some first results for that transition that we will then generalize to different aspect ratios to map out this line of phase transitions in the regime where interesting things are happening. And moving on again quickly to this eight supercharged super Yang bills, we again, we can do a twisted uh, formulation of this theory. It even turns out to be a simpler twist than the one we went through with the maximally supersymmetric cases, uh, in particular, the Blau Thompson twist rather than Donaldson Witten. So we take our eight supercharges, decompose them into one plus three plus three plus one that correspond to site, link, plaquette, and cube fermions on simple cubic lattices in three dimensions. This is a nice diagram from Anosh's work showing how the fermions are geometrically mapped to the simple cubic lattice structure associated with the diagonals along faces in the whole cube itself, as well as the three links. Now my graduate student, Angel Sherlatov has been working hard to add this separate case with this different twist as a new application in our high performance parallel code that is available for you to play with. All that we've done with that so far is run it through some of the same tests that we looked at earlier uh, here showing that word identity violations are directly proportional to the parameter of that supersymmetry breaking scalar potential that we still have to have. Um, those tests are now all passed. Larger scale calculations can get underway, potentially looking at mirror symmetry as, as an interesting target that I've talked about with uh, Joel Geet and some of some folks here and would be useful to talk about more as the week goes on. And part of the motivation for developing this code as well, and what Angel has moved on to focus his attention on is using that eight supercharged super Yang Mills theory in three dimensions as the starting point for four supercharged super QCD in two dimensions based on this quiver construction, a generalization of these theories where we are able to generalize the uh, system to have different gauge groups on different sites. We set up one two-dimensional slice with a gauge group UN, a different two-dimensional slice with a gauge group UF. There's bifundamental uh, fields associated with the links in between those two slices. And when we turn off the gauge coupling on the UF, the flavor slice, make that a non-dynamical global symmetry, we end up with just a two-dimensional UN gauge group coupled to uh, fermions and, and scalars in the fundamental representation. So in other words, super QCD in a smaller number of dimensions. So that's what Angel is working to develop right now. Um, more work in progress with no results available yet, but that I hope is illustrating that message that there's a lot of fun things to do in three-dimensional lattice supersymmetry. Public code is available, taking advantage of this topological twisting to avoid fine tuning problems by preserving a subset of that supersymmetry algebra. We have some nice results for the thermodynamics compared to the holographic predictions for D2 brains and are generalizing that to look at phase transitions in that phase diagram, as well as looking at the eight supercharged theory with an eye toward super QCD and much more for the future. So thanks for your attention. I, we may even have a couple minutes for questions before our break. Just a short question about the sign problem. Yes. You say you didn't encounter it, but that may be because the volume is not large enough, you know? So that's, that's an excellent question. And I'm very glad you asked it because it lets me uh, emphasize the, the point I was trying to make and probably rush through too quickly, which is that um, the particular continuum limit that we are taking with this fixed temperature demands that as we increase the volume, 
we have to dial down that Tuft coupling. So generically, we expect sign problems to get exponentially worse in the volume, but we're also seeing in these plots, which I rushed through, that um, the sign problem, the situation becomes better as the coupling gets weaker, even faster, then it gets worse as the volume increases. So we have those two effects, the larger volume causing a sign problem, the weaker coupling fixing it, and we're seeing that the weaker coupling is winning. So as we go, so that's a special feature of this particular continuum limit that we're taking with this fixed dimension to look at the thermodynamics and the gauge gravity duality. In principle, we can imagine just fixing the Tuft coupling, looking at large volumes where we would expect things to break down, but that's not where the physics lies because we've reduced dimensions to get this dimensional coupling. So thanks for giving me another chance to communicate that. Yeah, so this is an example of a sign problem, which really is not a sign problem of a theory, right? Yeah, so that's a distinction that... Yeah, yeah. and there yeah. are the same situation also occurs in, in two dimensions and was looked at. And in your n equals four, going back to your n equals four, is that a sign problem in the theory or is it a sign problem of the lattice regulation? As far as we can tell, that's in the theory. Okay, and but I, I think it's very important for us to try to decide which is which. <laughs> yeah, going to lower dimensions seems to remove that from the theory and just put it into a particular range of the numerical calculations. Um, any other questions? It's another way in which lower dimensions help make things a bit more tractable to grab hold of. Let's get you a microphone. Um, yeah, I, 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 hello. I just wanted to, to ask uh, concerning this very complicated phase diagram, um, which there was this M2 phase. So which kind of phases did you uh, study now except this, uh, this one phase transition? Excellent. So what we're looking at for uh, this first study, which I should have put on a plot here. So we started off just looking, confining ourselves to that D2 phase. And now the next step that we're looking at is keeping the two spatial directions fixed and looking only at the D2, D0 transition. So this can be further generalized in the future. We don't have concrete plans to do that yet. It's gonna depend on how much fun we have getting this into shape, but we're taking sort of the next simplest case, uh, keeping, two, keeping all the spatial directions fixed and just looking at this same sort of transition that we had in two dimensions and avoiding the uh, more complicated situation that comes when all three sizes of the torus can vary independently. Okay. Okay, any last questions? If not, let's uh, thank David.